Welcome to Nostalgia, the pop culture podcast where we have deep conversations about superficial things. I'm your host, Nicole Tremaglio, and each week my guests and I deep dive on the parts of pop culture that made them who they are today. If you like the show, please follow, rate, and review on your platform of choice. Watch us on YouTube and Spotify, and subscribe to our super fun newsletter at nostalgia.substack.com. Enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Nextalgia. I'm super excited to have my friend Ruby here with me today, who just came out with a book, actually, which I'm really excited about. We're going to chat about it, chat about all things internet, internet culture. And one of my favorite topics that I've been thinking a lot about lately, which is media ephemerality. So what is on the internet that is really meant to last forever? Or not. So thanks, Ruby. Glad to have you here. Happy to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. So, okay. Tell me about the book. So I think to begin first, it's just, I have like a general um, sort of love for niche internet um, communities and, and, and uh, cultures. My research is really focused on cyber ethnography. And so in the last couple of years, a decade or so, I've been just really um, focused on studying, but also researching uh, these communities. And and sometimes, uh, like some of my work with the Aum Facebook group, also preserving some of that. And so my book is called The Cyber Archaeology of Checkpoints. And it is the story of a digital community that lived under the common section of, uh, of, of, of YouTube video, essentially, for about 10 years. And I had seen the video like years prior and a conversation with my friend Dexter brought it right back to mind. I went back in around 2022 and I realized the video had disappeared. And that sort of tickled my fancy because I was like, I remember this being somewhat of an important uh, place on the internet. And I went around, I looked for it and I realized from Reddit that YouTube had deleted it based on like a DMCA request or something like that, you know, copyright. The video was this very simple loop of a video game background of the Donkey Kong Country 2 game and um, little vines and clouds, but the soundtrack of well, the soundtrack of, of the video game. And it was, you know, moody, moody, simple. It wasn't anything very particular, but under that video, 45,000 comments um, were there and a lot of them were called checkpoints and these checkpoints were personal divulgations stories about the people's lives and it would be something like checkpoint I just had my first son my life has changed forever they put their name and the date right the, the, the name would be the username and then the date and people would come back every six months every three months every year to do a new checkpoint and of course the idea of checkpoint is inherited from video games right where if you are in Sonic and you pass a checkpoint, if you die in the video game, you go back to the checkpoint. And so people were kind of doing this for their lives. And, and of course, you know, you can't really, it's not the same thing as a video game, but with, I guess, the emotional truth that if ever they were to perish, they would respawn at the last internet checkpoint. Yeah, I'm curious about your thoughts on the format for that, because we've seen people obviously treat their blogs or even their Instagram pages as personal checkpoints, sharing with people the milestones that they have in their life. Why do you think a YouTube video section, like why was that particularly relevant just specifically like as the real estate for this kind of connection? This is one of the central questions of the book because as a sort of technologist, designer, engineer myself, I spend a lot of time trying to build things that people will use. And oftentimes you think people are going to use a thing in a certain way and then they kind of subvert your expectations. And so the YouTube comment, I think I don't work at Google or at YouTube, but I assume it's just, oh, people will write about how they feel about the video. And that has been sort of the intended use of that place. Of course, it's led to, um, at least in the 2010s, 
a lot of um, <laughs> a lot of sort of toxic comments and um, there was like a culture around YouTube YouTube comments that uh, they were one of the worst places on the internet. But when we looked at the affordances of that comment section, namely it, the fact that it's pseudonymous, the fact that it's not really directed by any sort of you know major virality based algorithms. Um, I think maybe the top comments goes to the top and the, the, the video make can pin stuff. But essentially, it's, you know, fairly chronological and um, you're not really tied to the profile from which you post. Uh, and it's not and the profile on YouTube, if you're not a YouTuber or a content creator, is usually kind of bare. And so you have the possibility to, you know, to share your voice, still have it associated with you, but do it in a way that's slightly more concealed. And I think that ability to be pseudonymous, I think, allowed for this added honesty, probably, um, versus like an Instagram or something like that. And then, of course, there's a whole social aspect to it. Um, the first person does it and people do it over and over again. And any person who saw the video, you know, at the fifth year was like, wow, this has been going on for five years and people have been doing this. So um, I will partake in this internet tradition of the checkpoint. And so what this leaves me, the conclusion that leaves me with is like, Sometimes you design a park and you think that the park is going to be used for one purpose, but the internet uh, denizens, the people who are online, much like the people in a city, will determine where they want to hang out. It will determine what they want to do with the spaces you provide them. And you can do all the designing you want, but at the end of the day, the communities choose where they want to be. And in that scenario, it was a YouTube comment section. Mm hmm. I think it's really interesting in that you had talked about this in a talk that I had seen of yours recently about AI and in relation to my space and the shock of deletion. When you talk about checkpoints and figurative death in a game, it it kind of runs parallel in my brain of like, OK, you are checking in. Because what if you literally die? Um, it's the shock of deletion. What if YouTube suddenly removes a video? What if MySpace deletes all of the information on its servers? Even now with Facebook, where you can dedicate a legacy contact if you die mm -hmm. so that your social media can live on. And when the estates of celebrities post posthumously from a celebrity's account, it's either very surreal or very real, and I can't decide which. Yeah, I mean, the story of checkpoints is one very much rooted in this idea of the shock of deletion, which is you go to the place that you used to frequent digitally, and suddenly it's gone, right? And that is that is what I call the shock of deletion, which is this sort of jarring experience of no longer having access to a place that of course, used to, you know, frequent digitally. And what is evident from sort of internet research and from the stories, the stories of Tumblr, MySpace, uh, GeoCities, and, you know, and the million other pages, right, that have disappeared over time, is that this is going to happen more frequently and in a, at an increasing rate because there are certain incentives to, you know, either keep platforms on or just shut them down based on whether or not they make money. <clears throat> and what's very sad about this is that essentially people have spent, in the case of checkpoints, 10 years building this space. And suddenly just with one click, a YouTube product manager is able to just remove this entire thing. And part of the story, which I think is the reason why I like this one a lot is because when I did further research on it, I realized um, I found a person, Rebain2001, who had saved the video, first of all. And not only had she saved the video, but also she had archived all the comments, at least, you know, one or two months prior to the, prior to this deletion. And so I took all those comments and sort of stayed them on my own computer and reached out to Rebain and interviewed her to understand, like, how did that happen and how why, why she had done that? And um, yeah, it was amazing to see that some some people, right, some sort of independent archi archivists and people who cared very deeply about the internet were devoted to this mission of preserving it, at least on their own. 
servers or platforms or whatnot. And that was like one win in like an ocean of just deletions that were not saved. But I thought it was important to tell that story and to tell the impact of a person who is able to preserve um, what I think is like a monument to human history, right? It's just like 10 years of life in the 2010s and um, it's just so raw and real and true. And I'm so, I feel blessed as a member of an overall community that that story was preserved and will endure over time now, both through uh, Rebane's archive, both through my book and both through even the subreddit that exists for the community now. Yeah, I love that quote, forget what you lost, save what you can. I think so much, like I mentioned at the beginning of our chat about media ephemerality, and I think of how nostalgia and memory and experience, whether digitally or physically in person with people, how is everything really meant to be saved? I think when, you know, being of a generation where we're really the only ones to have an integrated analog and digital upbringing to get on the internet for the first time and have kind of the rhetoric around these, at the time, novel social media platforms. It's like, well, don't put that picture up of you. You're never going to be able to get a job. What if someone sees you? Whatever you put on the internet is out there forever. And now we've come to realize that that's simply not true. And that the same way, you know, as you were talking about uh, the shock of deletion and somewhere being gone, I think of, I used to have this hair salon that I would go to in Midtown. And one day I went to walk by to make an appointment and it was gone. It was a bodega. And I'm like, how, when? Who were they going to call me? Were they going to let me know? No, it was just completely gone. And it's not only an inconvenience, I still needed to get my hair cut, but it was also like, wow, we had some good times back there. And now yeah. there's no, there's no evidence of it whatsoever. And when it's in person like that, it just reminds me that every experience, every relationship, every place that you used to go in the old places that you used to live, the places you used to love, kind of everything is fleeting. And I don't know why we expected this sense of permanence from the internet in the same kind of way. But as we were are realizing that sometimes we got to archive, sometimes we got to cut and paste something else over it. And if you are cutting something, what happens to it? Is it inherently lost? And is everything worth, is anything worth saving forever? I mean, those are the big questions, right? And part of Rebane's story is one of loss of a specific video, which um, she had an infinity for, and the decision thereafter to save as much as possible. And in the interview, I asked her, so how do you decide what to save? Because she had seen the video, but was not a part of the community, of the Checkpoints community. So I was like, why did you save that one? Well, after she lost that first video, she decided that anything that seemed culturally relevant to the people of the internet, she would save. She now has over a million YouTube videos on like at home hard drives, not like a data center, just all at home. Um, which is incredible. We're talking like terabytes and terabytes. And part of that is just understanding or trying to see which pieces have this sort of cultural or societal resonance to sort of niche groups. And it's never going to be perfect, right? Because Rebane is only one person, right? So there goes that, right? It's not a script that sort of methodically archives everything. Um, and yeah, I mean, a, a lot of this sort of mirrors the physical, but there's an understanding, at least to most humans, or like in, you know, overall Western philosophy, that there is this sense of transience in um, the physical, you know, you start as dust and you come back to dust, right? It's like it's the Bible, like people understand that. And there was this, 
I don't, I don't want to say that anybody promised us that the internet would be a bit more permanent. But as you mentioned, there was this understanding sometimes that it was things didn't leave or things were sort of in a way that was kind of negative, like used against you. So be careful what you posted. And I think we took to that a lot. And essentially there were these affordances of digital media, namely that it was sort of reproducible. So now, you know, it was fault tolerant because I can have a copy, you have a copy, a million people have a copy. So if a million people have a copy, if I lose mine, I could just ask for somebody else's technically. And then there was, of course, the fact that it was sort of, you could sort of send it wherever you can preserve it locally. But what has happened is that in the abundance of digital media, this is kind of reversed, right? Because it works when you're just starting out the internet and just a few things and it's being shared from, you know, peer to peer networks. But as soon as you get what is essentially is libraries being written on a daily basis on the internet and more videos being uploaded every day than there were sort of previously in the history of, of cinema, then the nature of data and the nature of sort of digital media sort of loses its value because in order to understand the cultural relevancy of it, you need to parse through like hours and hours every day of digital media, which is essentially, at least for a human, impossible. Yeah, absolutely. Just simply due to the sheer amount of content and media that is produced on a daily, ba every second. Yeah. And um, I've been thinking about what I've kind of wanted my digital anthropology project of 2024 to be, because as we're wrapping up 2023, um, I'm not going to end my physical media renaissance, but a large part of this year uh, was spent focusing on kind of that friction of physical media and mm -hmm rebuying the CD boom box that I had when I was a kid and thrifting all of these CDs and thinking about the perceived value of CDs, for example. Um, but in looking forward to 2024, I'm like, you know what, it would be very cool to do a project where I basically have like a, I don't even know what to call it, like a digital get down day every month where I go through my social media channels, through my email, through every place on the internet where I could possibly have created a source of new material and evaluate and have mm. it kind of serve as a checkpoint and say, okay, it's January. I have, I have like 7,000 pictures on my phone. How did that even happen? I get an email every single morning saying, you have one month left on your pooled Google storage and you will not be able to save any new documents until you free up storage. I, I get slightly threatened each and every morning by this email from Google. And so, yeah, this I want to be my new project where I have a checkpoint day and say, all right, let's get down to business. What are we saving? What are we deleting? What are we archiving? What does it mean if I archive something? Do I still have access to it? Or how am I prioritizing my own access? I think about this concept too, where it's like, again, I have 7,500 pictures on my phone. Mm -hmm. I have pictures in my Google photos. I have like two separate flash drives. I have a literal old hard drive that I just have an old hard drive plugged into an adapter and, and it'll just be hanging out like while I'm trying to put, plug it into my computer. I have kind of these fragments of pieces of, of hardware that all hold like really important things. But at the same time, if I really wanted a photo of something, let's say it's a picture from childhood or mm -hmm. something. This is a deep cut. It's part of my lore, but it's something that I talk about regularly enough where I don't just want it stored on my external hard drive. I also took a picture on it on my phone so then I could keep it and show it to you whenever I want. I think about those varying levels of access you provide to your archives too. 
So part of this research, which is um, essentially an extension of my thesis research, as for my thesis project at, at the Parsons School of Design, what I did with checkpoints was um, present them physically. So I printed all of them on pieces of paper and made this like tower of, of essentially 30 to 40,000 comments. Um, and I think once you realize how much sort of like a paper, sheet of paper, right? Like just regular flimsy paper, even when it stacks up how much that represents, I think it really changes the way you perceive um, this, this data and access, you know, in the same way that I said that abundance devalues digital media, abundance also makes access harder. And so if you're looking for your picture, I guess like pre AI, you'd have to go and scroll through and, you know, like if it's a baby picture, kind of find it, or maybe you favorite it. But if you favorite out of 7,500 photos, then you have say like a thousand and still it's kind of hard to, to run through 75, a thousand images. And weirdly enough, my first idea was to preserve the video along with the comments in what I thought was going to be, what I, you know, claim was going to be this like indestructible block which was made out of resin and resin is made out of plastic. So it doesn't biodegrade. So it's going to be like around for like a million years. Right. Mm -hmm. And the paradox, it was like an art piece, right? So the paradox of the USB key in the block of resin was that yes, the comments and the video and the stories were going to be preserved, but how do you access it? Right. So you have this artifact that you find in a thousand years and you're like, I don't know what's on there. Um, you know, my spirit somewhere in, in, in floating, I was like, oh, well, this is the, the, the place where this was, but there's a very, there's a paradox in the act of preservation, which sometimes shields off the access, right? And that is something we have to reckon with when we're doing these sort of like anthropological, um, searches, because to even archive and remove a video from the original locus of YouTube to Hobune Stream, which is a uh, Rebane's private archive, which is um, public. It's a personal archive, but it's public, is also to remove it from its original context of interface, right? So YouTube was a specific interface. You had like specific memories and feelings towards it, and now it's in a different place. And so it kind of alters the way you interact with the piece of content, the piece of media. And so in many ways, there are so many different factors that influence the way we interpret and the way we engage with digital media that each act of preservation kind of brings it away from its like in situ, in vivo um, locale. I think it's something that we really need to think about. So for instance, what happens when the photos that you have, if you printed all of them out, how does that feel in a space? Like how does are they made to be digital or could they like live as physical objects and would that change your relationship with them? Um, perhaps you'd be like, I don't want 7,500 7, images in my house. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that would change your relationship to, um, to their relevance and to their value based on their materiality. Yeah. I mean, I've gone through now in my closet, I have one shoe box filled with photos and that's it. And that. I've always filtered what I've had. And I think part of it was due to living in small spaces for a very long time. You physically couldn't hold on to anything. And so I have always strongly filtered things. And I find that because I have a good memory, I tend to rely on that as much as a physical photo. Or even like I think about when I was going into third grade and I was moving houses only a mile down the road, but I had all of my art projects from elementary school. And my mom's like, we don't need to be bringing all of these into the new house. And so, you know, how better to frame it for me than like, let's do a fashion show or like, let's have an art gallery. Um, because that really appealed to, I mean, it appeals to me now, but it especially yeah. appealed to my, you know, eight year old self, let's do an art gallery. Okay. So I got to tape all of my artwork on the wall, stand and pose in front of it. 
My mm -hmm. mom took a picture of it. And so I don't have 75 pieces of different colored construction paper with various animals drawn on them. We just mm -hmm. have a couple pictures where I got to feel represented with my favorite pieces of work that I had created. And I feel like those pictures mean as much as if I had the original artwork. I do still have one. Um, we were, we were doing a Joan Moreau um, lesson in Project elementary Day. school. Yeah. And I, I drew in that style and I remember my bus driver held up the, it was a substitute bus driver, held up the, my picture for everyone. And they all kind of booed and they're like, this sucks. So I like get off the bus and I'm crying, but I always had that piece of artwork that I made when I was six years old and thought, wait, okay, this is kind of stunning though. I really did execute in the style. Um, that was, you know, part of the project. And so I have it hanging up in my bathroom now. And it just serves as a reminder that you can, art can be whatever you want it to be. And if I can keep that piece of physical art, um, but I still have my memory to go along with it. And even mm -hmm. as that was, you know, I don't know how long that was over 20 years ago. Now I still have the memory of the story that I tell about it. I think a lot about that too, where we kind of do this cognitive offloading of like, oh, my digital pictures or like my digital archive. I don't really have to remember things anymore necessarily because I could just look it up on my computer and find the information. Do you feel like that, that kind of cognitive offloading makes people more detached from their archives or their work or their memories? Or do you feel like it can be very supportive in that we do have so much, so much, so much new content all the time? There's not like enough room in our brains for it. I'm of the opinion, um, there's this thinker called Friedrich Kittler, um, who has this quote from his book, uh, gramophone typewriter film, gramophone film typewriter, um, which is that once media finds, uh, once acoustic media finds a, a place of storage, memory loses its function and its liberation is its end, right? When we're able to put what we used to remember as images in our brains into photos or sounds as music or you know, now digitally with all of our uh, quote unquote content or the things we create, there is an impact on memory and how you remember, right? This offloading is probably like a, a process which we've, 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 we've evolved to do, um, but it does have an impact in how we remember and how we see things, right? If you have an image of it, you may not sort of capture all the details of the experience that were not visual, because, for instance, there may have been, in the images of the art gallery, there may have been a smell of that room in the house. There may have been a feeling of the rug on which you stood when you took that picture. There may have been sounds, textures, um, uh, even the taste of the Mr. Freeze that your mom gave you after the art show, right? <laughs> All things that were not potentially captured within the image. And so I think it's important to understand that each medium has a set of affordances, a set of things that it can capture, but also a set of things it suppresses and a set of things that it does not capture. And when I think about the overall sort of shape of memory as it um, pertains to technology, I think about all the things we've also lost in our quest to preserve all these new forms of, of, of media. And there's, there's a poem called all the things we lost in, 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 in the book, um, which I think addresses this quite directly, which is like with each step of progress, there's always something that is lost and that it's, and I'm not saying that we should stop progressing. I'm just saying that we just need to acknowledge or grieve when it happens. Yeah, the things that um, 
leave us. It's very interesting to have kind of like these fragmented experiences as well. For example, a few months ago, I downloaded my Zanga blog archive and it was as a text document. And so the original, just like the YouTube page, mm -hmm. my original format was completely lost. I don't remember what my background looked like. I don't remember what what kind of the aesthetic presentation accompanied that written expression of mm -hmm. whatever I was feeling at the time. And I do think that that's important, but you know, you only have what you have, right? So on one hand, I can have the text that summarizes my own thoughts, but then if I Google or if I look in an archive for my space backgrounds, it's still nostalgic to be able to look at those and see them, but they're not mine. And so I think having that incongruency there can be a little bit uncomfortable, almost like, oh, I wish that, you know, I used to code all my own MySpace pages. Why did I not take a screenshot? Or yes, why did I not um, think to save it at the time? But then again, I don't even really want to save things or screenshot things now either. So I can't really be surprised that with less lived experience on the internet that I would have wanted to then either. Yeah. I mean, I remember when Pepe first came out in a lot of like niche Facebook meme groups, there was like a, a race to sort of save and then have on your hard drive, the rarest Pepe's like the pre NFT, right? It was just like, Oh, I have this one. I have that one. And um, it's like if you'd find the meme, save it before it got deleted because you knew that the pages would be taken down by Facebook because um, they were a bit too edgy or whatever. And so there was this economy of, I guess, like temporary preservation of this meme. And um, when the incentives are there, I think people tend to save things when they understand that there is something to be either gained socially or lost. Um, but the problem is that it's not always obvious and it's not always clear which part of the things that we've made in you know, a whole lifetime deserve that scrutiny and attention. And, you know, Rebane's approach, I think, has been very broad in like what one save. And I think like a million videos is a lot. But... I think it really depends on one's own desire for sort of remembrance. I, I know that I, I kind of have light hoarding um, tendencies. As, as a child, I used to get like the free paper in the subway every day and I just like keep it. And I kept like years of, of newspapers. And I'm almost like, why do you have these in our home? Like, I'm gonna throw these out. This is just like, this is trash. And most likely she was correct. Um, but I think it really depends on one's sort of attachment to these images, attachment to that media. And part of what may happen for the next generations is that that attachment might be not there because you understand that if you're born with the shock of deletion, you might just understand that things like that are transient and they come and they go. And if you, you know, you're, you're born with the shock of alteration, which is that you go on one interface one day and the next day it changes, then you might just not, you know, care too much about it because you've been um, sort of brought up or habituated to having all these changes. And that's really much, that's, that's, that's very, I think, resonant with life in the digital realm is that alteration and deletion happen often. And maybe one day as humans, we'll get sort of used to it. Do you think that that will continue to affect how art is made? And not, I'm not necessarily saying that a TikTok or an Instagram reel is or is not art, but I think of an example where Instagram was used for photos and then all of a sudden they're like, no, reels, you must be a content creator, you must make videos, you must be on your front facing camera. And so obviously this, among many other factors, affected the way that people created things and put mm -hmm. things out into the world. And so 
if we never really have a say of how those platforms are going to change, it, it's always to serve their own needs. But if the interface is always changing, uh, what is a way that we can most authentically create art? Is it that emerging platforms come where we're not beholden to a particular format? Um, yeah, what do you what do you feel like that looks like? I mean, that's like a huge question as well. I think, <laughs> um, you know, depending on what you believe and sort of your your internet philosophy, you know, there's like the Web3 answer, which is like a more like perma web. And so the art is, you know, using IPFS, so like interplanetary file system, which are um, um, temper resistant, fault tolerant file storage systems that are decentralized. So that's like one option. Um, and they have, I think, Filecoin, who uh, as a token in the ecosystem that ensures that these files are saved. Then you have like more like the 2000s approach, which is like torrents and peer to peer. And so in order for things to be shared and to be preserved, then maybe it's less about the platform, it's more about the one-to-one -one connection. Because um, the tendency for centralization of the platform also brings about the scale at which, you know, they could sort of mass delete. So whereas if it's peer to peer, the risk for mass deletion is much, much lo lesser, you know, it's really decreased by having such a format. Um, and then, I mean, future platforms, I think for sure now, what we see is, is you can always ex export all your data from these platforms. I think that's, that's become sort of customary, but I'm curious as to how many people actually do that. I know that it's an option. You can just go to your settings and export all your Instagram data, including your messages and your comments and all of it. But how many people are actually doing it? I would love to see those stats. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Theoretically, I think it would be interesting if maybe once I could see my AOL instant messenger chat history or my bio that I used to have or the buddy icon that I mm -hmm. used. Like it would be very cool to have an archive of like my buddy icon and the date that I changed it. Um, even now when I look at particular color and font combinations, I feel reminiscent like about that time. But, um, I don't know. It's like I feel very emotionally invested in my internet journey, uh -huh. but maybe me personally, there's just like a, I don't want to say a lack of sentimentality, but there's definitely a very radical acceptance of the transience of, I mean, material and of digital life. It's free. I mean, yeah, it's freeing. Of course. And that's like, you know, call it like, you know, the the Buddhist way of the internet. It's just like <laughs> to understand that these things are not for, for or, or, or not givens. And, um, you know, uh, I, I think the I, this idea is present in a lot of um, philosophies, you know, even in Christianity, even in Buddhism and just like this transients I think we could adopt with the internet now my problem with deletion is in a thousand years right once they find the remains of our civilization and try to figure out what kinds of peoples uh people we were it occurs to me that a lot of those traces will be digital in the same way that now we look at the tablets of ancient Sumer and we're able to identify that you know, this, they're not even, um, the funny thing about those tablets is that they're not uh, particularly, um, they're very mundane. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. going to be like, this guy owes me this amount of grain and this person forgot to pay me for this and a uh, girlfriend that. And um, I, have a, I have a piece that is just like translations. I made like a little zine, translations of ancient Sumerian tablets. And it's very mundane and things that people like, they felt like tweets almost. Um, yeah. And but in the same way to think about what we leave uh, as a legacy of civilization i think 
of course, there, there may be still be the buildings that we build or the bridges or whatnot. But those, this is just like infrastructure. When I think about the stories and the lives of the individuals within that civilization, those moments, those memories, those exchanges, a lot of them are on the internet. So to delete checkpoints, delete a platform is also to erase stories and also to erase what I call monuments of, of emotional history that could, you know, be windows into the lives of people in the modern world, but that's no longer there. And I think that has an impact into not now, but like a thousand, two thousand years from now, how our our own civilization is interpreted. There's an artist, Molly Soda, who posted a picture of her teenage bedroom from the 2000s mm -hmm. and there's just stuff all over the floor and she says this photo is more valuable to me than any photo I could have taken on vacation and I was stunned because I have a very similar photo of my bedroom floor in the 2000s and I laid all of my magazines out on the floor. I don't know why I just thought it was a cool thing to do. And I've since gotten rid of all of those magazines and I don't live in that house anymore, but I still have that picture. And when I think about capturing memories now and what I will come to archive in the future, I have come to also very much appreciate the mundane and the day to day and go, wow, you know what? It would be so cute if I like took a picture of my outfit, even if I didn't leave the house mm -hmm. or let me take a picture of what my apartment looked like. And those little things have become important. And I want to know if you were to leave a digital time capsule, maybe not a thousand years, maybe like 50 or a hundred years, and you could leave a little digital time capsule, or you could leave a little USB or something for people to know either you or the zeitgeist in which you lived before their time, what would be on it? What would you want to show them? That is a hard question. <laughs> um, I, so, uh, um, as a part of my sculpture, which had the USB inside of it, um, one of the iterations actually had writing on it as well, right? So I had engraved um, a checkpoint on the object so that the inside was represented on the outside. And I think that because of the issues with access that I mentioned, like once you encase something in resin, it essentially becomes extremely hard to access. Once something um, and the, the image was amber. Like when you have a bug that's preserved in amber, it's preserved pristinely. But to, you know, melt or open the amber to access the bug, you have a risk of destroying this like perfectly fossilized, um, not even fossilized, but petrified rather um, insect. And so I think I'd probably do a similar gesture because I think it will t it, it would tell them something about me that no image or sentence could tell i think it would transmit my desire to endure which i think is potentially like a fundamental quality and that exists within the gesture itself and not within the content um, and that would probably say a lot about the kind of person that I am. Do you think about the ethical or moral implications of digital life after death? Yeah, I mean, um, my, a, a great artist, my friend Conan had Conan Lai had a, a piece, um, which. I'm not sure if it was using an API of some kind, identifying the Facebook accounts of people who had died and had this tombstone on which the names are being projected. I think it's worrying that we don't have a clear idea about like what the steps are from that perspective. At least I know I don't, because I guess it hasn't happened, you know, in, in my life or my grandparents were not on Facebook or anything like that. But 
yeah, I think in like the next 20 or 30 years, that is going to be, that's going to be a pivotal question of culture, which is like, who has access to the accounts? What can you do with those accounts? You know, and, and, and where is the agency and what is the protection for a person who potentially did not want for you to keep posting on their account as a family member after their death, right? I mean, we kind of see this already sort of play out with musicians a little bit with the post posthumous albums, but the posthumous posts, I think, going to be a, a big question in the future. I don't have a specific idea. I've thought about it sort of in concept, but I don't have like a framework as to what would be the proper way to deal with this and what kind of things should a person do. It'd be a great service to maybe not the world now, but the world in 20 years when a lot of people who were brought up online start, unfortunately, to to perish. So you are familiar with AI and its similar moral and ethical implications. And in terms of integrating AI technology, and mm -hmm. that can be in whatever form you mm -hmm. find interesting, what is the quote world of today ready to accept in that, you know, now you hear some rhetoric, it's, it's, basically mass panic where it's like, well, what are the kids in school going to do about AI? And it's like, well, the same thing that we did about Wikipedia and the same thing that my parents did about calculators. Mm -hmm. And when teachers said, you're not going to have a calculator in your pocket, they did. You're not going to have a computer in your pocket. We do. I think a lot about the concepts in Chuck Klosterman's, but what if we're wrong, mm -hmm. where he basically says we cannot perceive the present until it is the distant past. And essentially mm -hmm. we can make presumptions about what the world will be like in the distant future, but that's based upon our inherent biases from our, our vantage point of the now. I think sort of on a Robin Hanson idea that I think each generation is like radically different from the previous one. And part of that difference is that you don't have that much in common with the next sort of upcoming generation because they're born in like a different environment, new technology. Um, and there is this rift with each of the new ones who arrive. And um, I think it's a fluid rift, but there's definitely a rift. And one thing I do believe is that as, as humans, we're quite good at adapting, meaning a child who is born in the age of AI will get accustomed to AI generated content. They'll get accustomed to questions being answered sort of on the fly by these systems. They'll be accustomed to potentially they'll develop an eye. This, this sounds kind of like, um, I think it was Lamarck, who was the biologist who thought that the giraffes got their longer necks during their lifetime. I don't mean to be like a Lamarckist, but I think that like a child who grows up with, with AI will learn to identify when something is fake, something is real. In the same way that now people are able to identify when a celebrity has face-tuned an image, right? Just because they've, they've grown up with Instagram, like, ah, this is face-tuned, this is Photoshop or whatever. And so what I foresee is, I think, an increase in astuteness at understanding when a technology is deployed. Um, and... I think it's going to be difficult for the older generations to develop that astuteness because of course they were in a, in a, in a pre pre paradigm shift world. And so they didn't really develop those muscles and the people who will develop those muscles, I think will be the ones who adapt the best to this new reality and this new situation. Yeah. I think a lot about aesthetic labor and AI and how basically, you know, we had magazines to make us, question our self-image and then we had instagram filters to make us question our self-image and i also very much hope that younger generations develop this sense as well of media literacy and i think that as they do we will continue to see kind of this divide between completely analog and digital generations as one start as the scale tips mm -hmm. um, from one side to the other where older generations I hope that they can you know if they're harboring a resentment about the fact that they were not media literate mm -hmm. as these major paradigm shifts in telecommunications and mass media shifted um basically feeling sorry for themselves that they fell for it when younger generations might have a more keen eye. That's what I like to think. I, I think with millennials, we've proven that even if we know better, we don't do better. 
but yeah. uh, I will remain optimistic for the future. I think that's an interesting thing because I've seen reports more than studies of, of things like scam working more on Gen Z than on millennials because the understanding of the internet is slightly deferred. And because the millennials were born with that like Gen X or boomer skepticism of like, everything on the internet is fake. Don't read Wikipedia. There's a, a higher tendency to doubt what you see. And uh, the thing that I said, I think can also happen, um, can, can be flipped. Whereas if we naturalize, naturalize technology, meaning we make it seem as an always there and we don't imbue criticality in the literacy, then we might be in a situation where the new generations don't ever question it. And I think that would be also negative. So we got to find a, a, you know, a middle ground, like a, a, a moderate middle ground between both understanding what the technology is, developing the literacy, but also having the tools to understand when it's deployed. So it's going to be a few different things that need to converge for us to be sort of ready for this new age uh, and not, you know, be caught in, um, a present, a present that we no longer control. Mm -hmm. Amazing. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. This is awesome. Tell the people where they can find you and your book. Yes. So you can find me at being underscore on be the underscore line being online with, you know, little underscores under it. Um, and uh, that's me on Twitter and Instagram and, 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 and TikTok and YouTube and, basically all my platforms. Um, and the book is going to be linked in my bio and it's called a cyber archeology span of checkpoints. It's published by Irrelevant press. Um, and it's going to be at a few different, it was just at the printed matter zine fair this weekend in New York. And it's going to be, uh, like I said in Miami at the muses event by future commerce. And I'll try to tour it around a little bit so people get access to it. Um, uh, but thank you so much, Nick, for having me. It's been wonderful speaking. Of course. Thank you again for coming on. Thank you everyone for listening and we will see you next time. Bye. Bye. That's a wrap for this week. If you like Nostalgia, connect with me on social at Nicole Tremaglio. Subscribe to the Nostalgia newsletter at nostalgia.substack.com and follow, rate, and review on your platform of choice. Everything's linked in the show notes, including where to find out more about our guest of the week. Thank you so, so much for your support. And that was this week's episode of Nostalgia.